Hey there, welcome to another episode of Carve Your Own Fucking Path, a podcast made to inspire you to create a life in business on your own terms. You'll hear candid interviews with people who have boldly decided to blaze their own trail, and the occasional solo show with me, your host. I'm Willa McDonough, on-camera coach, storyteller, and remote video producer. Five years ago, I moved from my home base of San Francisco to the coast of Portugal, taking a big leap into the unknown. Some called it courageous, I called it carving my own fucking path. Today I live in Lisbon and run a business that elevates your online presence, helping you show up confidently on camera to create videos that showcase your brand and personality so you can get more visibility and attract clients by being yourself. If you're just starting out in business or you've been doing it for a while, you're sure to pick up tidbits of actionable advice and hopefully feel inspired by stories from people who have chosen the unconventional and sometimes messy path. And if you've been waiting for a sign to start carving your own fucking path, this is it. I'm so happy you're here. I'm excited for you to meet my next guest, Dale Wannan, the green money guy. He's a sustainable investor who helps you put your money where your values are. So if you do care about where your money is invested, and want to learn more about going green, stay tuned. He's going to bust the myth that sustainable investing doesn't bring big returns and share some stories about working in the crazy world of finance. All right, let's meet Dale. And we're live. Take a deep breath, Dale. Mm. Together. Welcome to Carve Your Own Fucking Path. I'm here with Dale Wannan. Careful, the chair is squeaky. We're actually in person. And this is a, a rare occurrence. And when I can, I love to be sitting in the same room as my guests because it's a little more fun. Mm-hmm. So for those of us, you can't see us, but we're like huddled around this small microphone recording into Zoom. And we've had a lot of technical difficulties so far. So let's hope things, you know, let's just have a good time. So Dale is a sustainable investor. You're a finance guy. Mm-hmm. And you turned into the sustainable investor guy about 10 years ago. And that was probably when we met like a little over 10 years ago. And I remember you telling me what you did and I was totally clueless. Like, what, what do you mean? Well, I didn't know anything about investing back then, really sad to say, but you were carving your own fucking path in this field because it was, it was early on. I think when there was this awareness about, you know, investing, but investing in things that are going to do good for the planet instead of just dumping all your money into Mm -hmm. fossil fuels. So I'll let you, uh, you know, tell your backstory because Mm -hmm. I always like to start there. And, um, why don't you take us to when you were eight or nine, like, Mm -hmm. how did you get into numbers and money and, and all that? So I know that that's kind of when it started. So thanks for being here, Dale. Sure. Thanks for having me. Well, this is going to be very exciting. (laughs) Um, wow. Eight or nine. I had a probably a bowl of like fruit loops in front of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and the newspaper would come on the weekends, you know, my mom and dad would, uh, would read the Sunday press or whatever. And I don't know what happened, but I kind of stumbled through like Garfield and all those silly comics. I was like, they're not really that funny, but I went straight to the numbers page. And again, I don't know why, but I just loved watching. Um, like the price of McDonald's stock go from $12 to $14. Granted, I didn't have any money. I was eight or nine. But the point being is there was something about watching the value of these companies go up and down. Um, And I probably just had like a happy meal from McDonald's like the week before. And I was like, this is pretty cool. So that's kind of where it started. Okay. But let me ask. So how did you even know that this was a stock? I I mean, eight or nine, You did your parents to have stocks and they told you about it. This is like, yeah, I think my okay. dad probably had stock. My dad, my dad was a pit boss in the casinos oh. of Atlantic city. If you wow. haven't been, check it out. It's a really good time. Um, no. Great place to bring your kids, right? Yeah. The Did... boardwalk. And mm-hmm. they, they still, most of them still have smoking indoors, which wow. is get a really good kind of uh, nicotine when you're a young child walking through, but no, yeah. I think that was it. And I think, you know, they were, these businesses like Trump and stuff, they were then publicly traded. Mm-hmm. So publicly traded means that you can actually buy stock. In them. So I think it just kind of sparked my interest that way. And it was just so cool. And I would literally get like a pad of paper as a kid. And I would write down the names of stocks, like in my little handwriting, <laughs> the value of it. And then like what it went up or down. Like I probably did this on a weekly basis because I would just look at it once a week. 
But um, yeah, and there's like Boston Market. I don't know if you remember that, but mm -hmm. the gro the market, like the grocery store. It's it's like a it was going to be like the next big thing after mm. McDonald's. Oh, okay. Like you could go in and get the walk in and get like a great piece of chicken or like cream spinach or something. So Boston Market came really quickly, I think across the country. I know it was definitely on the East Coast, which is where I'm from, but um, and I just remember following Boston market for whatever reason. It's funny to this day. I look at it every once in a while when I'm bored, the company went from like 60 bucks to like 40 cents. Oh, year. wow. Okay. Yeah. So it tanked. Yeah. So good thing. I was only using like paper mm -hmm. and not my own actual money when I was eight or nine. Okay. Did you, when did you start investing? Wow. I mean, probably in college, I started like opening an E-Trade account when I was like 18 or 19. You know, it wasn't like my parents had money. They were like, hey, here's your brokerage account and here's this buttload of money that you can play with. Mm -hmm. And I, I I remember, I can't tell you the name of the stocks, but just losing every time. Oh, you did? Yeah. Like I put 500 bucks in some company that was a buck a piece. And I was like, this sounds really cool. They're doing like, they're making paper in a different way. And then the 500 bucks goes to like 50. And you're like, right. This okay. was kind of during the, those you heard all these penny stocks come out and stuff and you yeah. get like faxes. I don't know if the young mm. river snappers that listen to this know what a fax is, but you get like a fax that says, like, have I got a deal for you? This stock, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I remember losing each time, but it was, it was a great learning experience. Like, oh, maybe I should look into these things more than mm -hmm. just. That is fascinating because yeah. if you don't have someone guiding you, a parent or someone, it's, and that's what it's always fascinating to me about when you're young and you know, like there's something that really lights you up mm -hmm. and whether that's, you know, because of your surroundings or a teacher or a parent or something, but it's something when you're so young that before you know really about this is going to make me a shitload of money. If I get into finance, you probably didn't think that way, but it, it was interesting to you. And then you followed that and here you are, however many years later. Yeah. And this is what you're doing. Yeah. It it's Pretty been cool. a long journey. <laughs> so been a long. Like, it's been crazy. The yeah. stuff that I've dealt with to get where I'm at, which feels like mm -hmm. the, the good place to be in the business and yes. just the weirdos that I've run into. And I've worked for a lot of weirdos. Okay. And so, um, yeah. So Dale's <laughs> writing a book mm -hmm. and it's going to be, I don't know the title yet, but it's in line with, it's like financial con confidential, mm -hmm. right? Like kitchen confidential. Yes. So yeah. So I wanted rest to have peace, Anthony Bourdain, right? Yes, rest in a peace. Legend, yeah. And I wanted to have you on, you know, just share some of your stories. And also, if people aren't investing, maybe so I'm, you know, at the end, so stick around for the end because Dale's gonna give mm -hmm. us some tangible takeaways and things that you can do at various stages. Let's say you have a ton of money and you're like, great, I want to do good with this. And if you've never started, so if you could hit on some of those things. Yeah. Um, be great. Yeah, and this is hopefully everybody will buy the book when it comes out, <laughs> but this is what people are like. You got to tell these stories about the different characters and the ways that you've seen the business mm -hmm. and you know, life's too short. And sometimes I say things in front of other colleagues that are in the business. Oh, you're crazy, man. Like, you know, and I'll talk about annuities and things like that, but stories. So, you know, I started off, uh, you know, I went to college, got an undergrad for whatever reason, just partied a lot um, in a small school called Rowan university in Jersey, right outside of Philly. We take the train to Philly every Friday and just party with all my Irish and Italian buddies. But it opened my eyes. I took an economics course um, and it just opened my eyes and it didn't have anything to do with numbers and money. It had to do with like thinking and strategy. That's not an interesting story there. But then as soon as I graduated, I was like, oh, I think it was like 1998, late 90s, like grunge music. And we were all going to fish shows and doing a lot of whippets and stuff like that. But um, I was like, I need a job. I had like maybe 1500 bucks in the bank. And I was like, oh, I got to pay rent. I'm living with a buddy. And, you know, you just go through the ringer and eventually I just work for an insurance company. I was like, oh, they're paying a salary. That's awesome. Like right off the bat, even though salary only lasts like two or three months, like, well, I better start working. So that was my first entry professionally into the business. And it was gnarly. It was like the, probably the worst way to get into the business, which was making 125 cold calls a day. Mm. I remember to this day exactly the image of the manager. He was like a church going, nice guy, but just there was about 15 of us young guys and it was all guys. Um, 
like a two inch thick stack of paper, all with just names and numbers <sighs> and addresses of right local there. people. And you're just, and they were, he was just like, all right, boys, you've trained for two months. You go ahead. And you just start dialing 125 calls a day, like five days a week. That is insane. It was crazy. It was. And you had a script, I'm assuming. So you sit there with your script, replace, yeah. you know, hi, Betty. Everything. Have you thought about yes. your health insurance? And half the time they would say, oh. go fuck yourself. Right. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay, well have a nice day. Half the time they were like, they would just tell you weird things like, oh, my bunions are killing me. Call me back <laughs> later. But then every, yeah. every hundred calls, you got one or two people who are like, oh, come on over to my house. I'd love to learn more. And you would just like salivate, like I'm going to their house. I'm going to wear like, mm-hmm. you know, I was 21 or 22 years old. And so um, that was it. Yeah. So personality wise, you are very East Coast. You're outspoken. You have a lot of energy. I mean, you're an extrovert, right? I'm not. You're not. Yeah, I've okay. I've taken the tests and everything because okay. you get me at a party and it's like, blah, blah, blah. And hey, let's, let's have a good time. But then I, I've heard that a lot of ex- people, a lot of extroverts, I mean, a lot of people who talk a lot and are mm-hmm. out there, they're really introverts. They're just covering up oh. for the inability <laughs> to, <laughs> to actually be in public. So, okay. Interesting. But, yeah. I, I'm just saying, because in that role, it takes a lot of courage. Yeah. And maybe that's being young too. Mm-hmm. Kind of like, well, what else am I going to do? Sure. So you just dove in, just dove in and you get one or two commission checks, like $3,000 check from selling some 85 year old lady, a, a long-term care policy. And man, you're living large. Granted, mm-hmm. I, you have to pay tax on that money too. So don't forget the commission checks would come in every once in a while, but yeah. And then you get a taste of it. And you're mm-hmm. like, Oh, this is, you know, and not to say it was evil, but you also realize like, wow, you can make money from working hard. I mean, it really was, it wasn't like, I get a lot of young people these days. Like I want to get in the business. And like, how'd you, they ask me, how did you get in? And then I go into this 20 minute story and it keeps going from the insurance companies. So, so. yeah, well, let's keep going oh, okay. because, <laughs> Oh, we're not going to stop there because, well, I think these days people see the success, they see the money or they, and they think, okay, finance. Yes. You're guaranteed. This is back before the internet yeah. and cell phones. Right. I mean, I'm the, we're the same generation. Yeah. So it, times have changed hugely. And I don't know if those days are still around of like, pick up, you know, go through the phone book, make 125 calls a day. I think most people would say, fuck that yeah. and not do it. Sure. Okay. So then take us yeah through the finance. And I know you've got some juicy stories for us. Yeah. I mean, I won't get too juicy <laughs> to buy me a beer later or something. <laughs> no. But yeah. um, so then I was like, I did that for a year and a half. And I was like, this is horrible. Like this was just, you would just leave appointments. Like, I can't believe that lady just gave me a check for $6,000 for something she probably doesn't even need. Mm. So, you, you know, you start to learn. And then I moved on to work for a bank because I was like, oh, this is easier. You go walk, you have your own branch. And that was kind of cool because you start to learn about how the banking business works. It wasn't just about lending. I got my securities licenses through the banks, which means I was then able to sell stocks and funds and all that stuff. And you were just, again, in front of people every day. You know, if if Mr. Jones had eighty thousand dollars in his savings account, he was going to get a call from from me because you were. This is so long ago, and um, times have changed. Yeah, well, I'm trying to remember this. The bank, my manager would say, "We need sticky products." We, I remember him using the word "sticky oh, products" sure. because um, because they wanted the client to stick around, and so mm. going from a savings account to a mutual fund, um, it, it was crazy. And you were so you could see the number that was in the bank in their bank account. Yeah. You'd call them up and offer them products again, like mutual funds or something. Yeah, that's crazy. It's, it sounds pretty like oh, that seems pretty good. But you, what you were doing, and the sad thing is, in years after I left, we I didn't know this again. I was now I was twenty four or something. We were selling these things called proprietary funds. And again, I'm bringing this up because I've seen the bad in the industry, and you, you learn to stay away from that. And these proprietary funds. The banks, a lot of them got hit with it because they were selling funds, only one fund family, and the bank owned the fund family. Mm -hmm. And that may not sound interesting, but you can't do that. That's like walking into Whole Foods, and the only thing you can buy is a Whole Foods product. And it's just like, is that right? No, that doesn't seem right, but they were doing it. And they got caught for doing that and stuff, but Mm -hmm. little did I know that that was bad. Okay. And so then you're working at a bank and... Did you think, okay, now I want to start like trading? 
you know, and doing that actually 9-11 happened. So, mm-hmm. and coming from the East Coast, I was in Jersey about two hours away from New York, like watching it on TV at the bank. <laughs> I remember um, 9-11 happened and, and for East Coasters, it was pretty, it was oh, right in your face. And so I had an, like, I had buddies that were like, we're moving to California. This is crazy. And I was like, you know, I think I might want to go with you guys. And that was the start, even though I still didn't do, was not doing anything with sustainable investing at that point, but I knew like, all right. I got to get out of here. Like Mm -hmm. I got to go check out. I've never even been, but we got an apartment. Didn't even look at it beforehand. Never even been to California. (laughs) I I had a Jeep Wrangler. It was a soft top, (laughs) you know, like a bad soft top. California dreams, your hair blowing in the wind. (laughs) I remember I brought a VCR player into, in the, in the Jeep Wrangler Mm -hmm. with me. Cause I was like, I'm going to need a VCR player. Of course. And I still have the VCR player in my basement (laughs) to this day. Cause it's like, I remember friends yeah. just being like, dude, nobody drives across country with a VCR player. But back in 2002, mm-hmm. kind of we're still using them. I mean, yep. So, but the bank was fun. I learned a lot. I met interesting people and, you know. Uh, so yeah. then you, you, did you move to San Francisco then? I did. Straight okay. The city. Yeah. Uh, no job or anything. But again, I was licensed as a securities broker, financial advisor. And so ended up working for another bank um, and it was great. And that was that. And I started again, continually trying to hone in on like, do I really want to do this? I really wanted to be a weatherman during this whole time. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know why, but the weather was that. interesting to me, but um, yeah, just, and then I went and traveled. I met a, a, a great girl and we traveled for six months in South America. And I only bring that up. It has nothing to do with investing, but man, it really, <laughs> it's okay. We it, want those yeah, stories. Yeah, too. But it'll really open your eyes. Like, yeah. And I know you have probably had a lot of world travelers on your podcast and just if a young person says, should I go to grad school or go get my job and go work for a community bank or something like, I always say travel if you can right away, yep. like just do it. And I was in my, I wasn't young. I was probably in my late twenties when this happened, but I had a couple great now, like every once in a while, I save a few more grand in the bank and six months in South America. And it was just great because it opened your eyes. You really see it. I remember when I went to South America for three months by myself, you messaged me oh. and you're like, I love South America. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Really thought about moving there, but yeah. It, it, stomach, I've done yeah. stomach issues. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, travel is it, that's been what I've spent most of my money and time on for sure, because it does open your eyes it to does. different things. And then I moved abroad. And it gives you a good but, perspective, it, whether mm-hmm. you're selling investments or you're selling computers or whatever it is, it just gives you a better perspective to speak with people. Definitely. Yeah. So tell me, like the the banking behind the scenes. What is that like? Because we've seen Wolf of Wall Street, and yeah, and like it's what, what's the truth. Well, first of all, I'll get to the dirty stuff in a second, if you really want me to. But the <laughs> bank, you know, they're machines. There's a reason yeah. that they have fancy offices. Mm. They're money machines and they have they have branch managers. Then they have district managers. And it's like a, it's pretty wild because everybody is telling everybody else to do more. Right. Mm-hmm. And, like, and you're the I was the low man on the total pole selling things to the actual consumer. And it's just and I know a lot of businesses are like this, but it's just like, wow what a machine. Cause they just have to make the numbers. You have to meet your quota, blah, blah, blah. But it's just, it's a grind and it spits people out quickly, but it was fun. There was a lot of good people. I mean, you're, I was, I was a young man and it was fun. Like hanging out with bank tellers and the girls, like the girls, like <laughs> West side story, um, <laughs> you know, the guy with the suit, who's mm-hmm. making a little bit more money than the lender or the bank teller. It was just sort of this like, Oh, I'm the man. Cause I have a suit on mm-hmm. and people come talk to me in that corner office back there. Was I really a man? Probably not, <laughs> but um, it was fun. And but you got to know when to get to know when to walk away. Mm. And it just wasn't challenging. Oh, it wasn't. No. Okay. So it yeah. became like it, so predictable or yeah. something that, okay. So you weren't challenged. And yeah. just, no. And you're selling like bank loans and annuities and mutual funds and investments. And it's just, mm-hmm. there, there was, there was no substance to it. But you were craving eventually more. the substance came. Yeah. Well, what yeah. about substances? Definitely. <laughs> a lot of that. Yeah. There was plenty of that. I mean, <sighs> yeah. but we were into like widespread panic and fish and oh, there was a lot of substance on the East coast going around with those kind of music shows, so but you listen to that kind of music. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised I by that. People, hear but it. I don't know it so well. I'll be playing golf here, like in Sonoma County and just, I play golf once in a while, just get my mind off things and like, Oh, you're, you're in the, investment business yeah yeah 
And then they're like, oh, we start talking about music. I'm like, I'm a big fish fan, fish head. They're like, what? Like, <laughs> well, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But oh, that's... but I don't know that I just can like think of a person that would listen to that kind of music. Sure. But it's investment advisor. No, guy. but I have another girlfriend. I'm like, you listen to them again as we make judgments and stereotype people. Sure. I mean, you shouldn't. Yeah. Right. Well, not all the time. <laughs> yeah. So were you going to say something? I was just going to say, then moving on from there. Yes. I want you know, it's, you start, you just, every once in a while, you feel like you want to make a change. Right. Mm-hmm. And the sustainable investing was starting. I moved to San Francisco and it was a little bit more out there, even though it wasn't, this was early two thousands. It still wasn't primary, but. Um, didn't, didn't you get a green MBA or something? I did. Yeah. I okay. I remember a lot that. of money, on, yeah. but it was a great experience. Yeah. Right? So that mm-hmm. was later in my thirties, of course, when, it was a good time to do it because I was now at, at, through the ringer and I eventually became something called a portfolio manager for a gentleman named John Harrington, who's sort of like my Obi-Wan Kenobi to this day, mm-hmm. um, because he's like this guy that lives up in the Napa Hills and like a true pioneer in the field of sustainable investing and like activism, but nobody knows him. He, it's just so funny. He like puts the hood on his head and like, but he's, he's like got dancing. a pretty big firm, mm-hmm. not a lot of employees, but he, he keeps a tight ship. But, um, People like that, that he really inspired me. He became, okay. like, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm Luke Skywalker now. Mm-hmm. Whatever Obi-Wan tells me to do, I do. And it was just really a, an eye-opening experience. But the power of mentorship. Huge. It's huge. And it's a, a kind of a lost art, I feel like, these days. Or you, you, know, you go to school, you have to pay people a lot of money to be your teacher, mentor. So this, So you saw him running his own business, but not necessarily being in the spotlight. Yeah. Met him at a... At a drinking party in San Francisco just happened like, Hey, what's going on? You know, mm-hmm. I was like still a goofy guy in my thirties, still goofy, <laughs> but I'm in my forties, but less goofy, but um, more serious now. just what, are, what are the odds that you run into somebody like that? Mm-hmm. And I was in the midst, I was at UBS, which is a big broker house in San Francisco. And again, doing the cold, still back to the cold mm-hmm. call, selling like municipal bonds to people in the Bay area. And I was like, what am I doing? I keep digging myself back into these things, even though it, it incrementally, it, it added to my um, experience in the business mm-hmm. each time. Like each time, it's like carving a stone. Like, um, but eventually, it just again the weather. I was going to go to school, become a weatherman. I still wanted to go back to that, mm-hmm. but maybe I will when I'm like, I was in my sixties or seventies. Yeah, you still want to do that. I mean, <laughs> but why you. not? Yeah, right. It's a lot of like science, though. Yeah, and like really, our class. and you'd have to be on camera. Yep. And Dale and I, we're going to start shooting some videos together for his business. And he's terrified of being on camera. So maybe... people looking at me in general, it's just <laughs> this will be a good, good uh, yeah. practice. Yeah. So the, the feeling, could you bring us like into a moment when you're like, I'm going to carve my own path. Like I'm going to do my own thing. and I'm going to get away from these big companies. Is there a, dis- a distinctive moment that you can like recall about that? Great question. Um, I think it was, it's been on my mind the whole time. Maybe I was just too scared to do anything about it because I was getting experience at all these different firms and banks and things like that. Um, I, when I went to work for John, again, my Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan. Kenobi, mm-hmm. yeah, Obi-Wan, I saw how you're supposed to do it, in my opinion. I really saw like his clients love him. Um, he, he was advocating for change at companies that just weren't doing good things. Mm-hmm. And he was truly aligning values with money. And this, you know, this was 15 years ago, at least more than that, 16, 17 years ago when I worked with John, I was with John for about six years. But um, that was my true moment when I think I saw this is kind of the right way to do. John kind of carved his own path. I got my MBA while I was working. It was mm-hmm. a four year if, part time, which also helped me meet a lot of interesting people that were involved in sustainability. And like they were. Um, people who want to get a business degree, but at the same time care about the planet, which there's only a few of them out there, including myself. And so, and you spend just as much money as maybe some of the big schools to do it. But that was super cool because there's a lot of nice people out there and you really want to align yourself with them. But um, yeah, the, the moment really was when I was like, John, can I be a partner in your firm? He's like, nah, I don't hire partners. You know, and I'm, if, John, if you ever listen to this, like it wasn't like that, but it was like, okay, I think I'm going to start my own business. And I knew I had no, no clients or anything. And I was like, thanks, John, a handshake. And thanks for six years. Like, and I did it. And again, I kept saving a little bit more money each time I was at these jobs. But um, I just felt like uh, if I'm going to do it, do it now. I was in my 30s. 
um, didn't have any kids or anything at the time. And so it was great. It was scary. Like just zero clients. Okay. Day one, what do you do? I have no clue. I'm going to go talk to this person <laughs> just because you got to talk to people. And remember, for, well, you're for good 20, at that. Well, I guess I am because after 20 years of doing it or 15, years, you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I can just talk to people. And then giving talks in front of larger groups mm-hmm. about like, you know, truly, do you really care like about the, your kids and your grandkids? Because if you do, owning like coal mining companies is just, you really don't care. And I, I'm quick to point the finger at people like, are you? I do it all the time and I, I, it's life's too short. Like, but why sustainable? Why, why for you? What is your, what's your why? Mm. It's a casual question. It's a huge question. I, <laughs> huge. I thought you were going to ask this and I actually couldn't think of an answer. Mm. And I don't know. I guess I just care about something. Like I have a twin sister and she's a social worker. She works with like runaway kids in Jersey. She literally like chases kids because they run away from the mm-hmm. facility. But, and so there's, maybe there's something inside of us. Maybe my mom and dad instilled something inside of us and kind of said, you should care a little bit. If you're going to do something, you know, have it make some sort of effect, a positive effect, and don't just kind of bounce along. But I, I really, I may have to get back to that because I keep trying to think about why am I doing this and what is it? Is it selfish? I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning behind. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. I wish I had a better answer for you. It's just well, like, it's okay yeah. because it it is clearly so ingrained mm-hmm. that you you haven't there isn't a defining moment. This is you know why I'm doing this, but you kind of just said it. Your parents yeah. instilled making an impact positively on on the planet. Yeah, even though neither of them were environmentalists or anything, they were hardworking people. But I I, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it's... so now you have kids, mm-hmm. right? And what is, what kind of things are you teaching them about, mm-hmm. let's yeah. say sustainability and I don't know how old they are, but yeah, they're eight and six now, two little girls that are adorable. Yeah. The toughest job I've ever had, like mm-hmm. the, that job. It's not a job to be a parent. It's a full-time job. It's you think getting an MBA and like, you know, in grad school, they teach you like, well, be in a group of people and learn to communicate and listen. Like that was pretty hard. There were some real real wackos in, in grad school, you're like a young person. But honestly, like trying to get kids to put on socks or, and this is going sidetracked, but I still to this, it still frustrates me. Like maybe it's a controlling thing and they can now have my own firm. It's my baby. This is the thing. But yet these two little children, th- there's no control in them. Mm-hmm. In fact, I'll walk out the door. Like I'll tell my wife, I'll just be like, I'll be back in 10 minutes. I cannot control. Like they won't. I give them mac and cheese. Like that's what you get. But apparently they're supposed to get like three choices these days. So a gluten free option, yeah, a vegan option. Not good. Yeah. But I'm sorry. To, no, no. It, it, um, so because, yeah. So it's, it's yeah. totally different. It's like it's a, living in like yeah. Sonoma County, California. Like they'd already know what composting is. Like mm-hmm. they asked me, well, is this compost or is this biodegradable? <laughs> yeah. Like I'm like, wait, how do you know that? I didn't learn until I was like 30. Mm-hmm. But it's already ingrained in them. I mean, electric cars, you know, we have an electric car. Like, that's so cool mm-hmm. of them, like to just be able to plug it in. So I think, and everything's generational, in my yeah. opinion, like this, I'm in my forties now, but it's this next generation is going to be a huge shift, but it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take 20 more years of their lives. So I, I really think that this generational shift thing, mm-hmm. it's sad because the question now is, do we have enough time? Like, and I'm not one of these like tree hugging crazy people who like, and I have clients that are really scared about like where things are going, but I definitely feel like we all should think about like, hmm, what's it going to be like in a hundred years? Like we really should just kind of think about that. Yeah. And the investment piece, just that's all I've been doing for 20 years. So I know that's how I am contributing or attempting to contribute to the thing. Right. You didn't even know that there was sustainable investing mm-hmm. until you met Obi-Wan, right? And actually, no, Obi-Wan oh. <laughs> wasn't, John wasn't the original secret. <laughs> At UBS, they have these people called wholesalers that used to mm. come in, the broker. And if you're, mm-hmm. if you, people know the business, they come in every week mm-hmm. it's okay. they, to sell their funds, right? Mm-hmm. And they're usually just like, oh, we have a great fund. Anybody want to go to the baseball game with us? Like, you know, but this one person, his name is Jeff. I don't remember his last name. He came from a, a group called Calvert Funds, which is one of the oldest sustainable fund group out there. And he gave a speech that was like, it blew me away. Like, and again, I was at UBS selling municipal bonds to, to old ladies. And 
he didn't even talk about like stock returns or anything. He literally said, do you know what McDonald's is doing compared to, um, you know, Costco or whatever, you know, what is Walmart doing compared to Costco? He was pinpointing at that moment. And this again is at least 15 years ago, more than that, maybe 20. Um, and the other brokers in the, in the room were just looking at this guy like, is he crazy? Like, why is he even talking about what the environmental effect of McDonald's using non-cage-free eggs is? But with me, man, I just salivated. I literally was like, oh my God, this is it. It was a huge moment because then I knew. And then I started selling Calvert funds and other green funds um, at UBS. And I was like, this is the only way I'm going to do it. Mm. That was it. And if I didn't make it, I didn't make it, but I knew I was going to go out selling just sustainable funds. Okay. So it started before Obi-Wan Kenobi came in, but yeah, it just so, felt so good that I can, you know, even though who knows what the difference to this day that we're making. Mm -hmm. So what if you don't own a coal mining company? What's the effect? I think it's a huge effect, but other people would argue that it's not. But. Argue as in, okay, that little, like your investment isn't necessarily going to stop coal mining. That's right. Right. But it so is. So if you pull out, but it is. It Imagine is. if we all joined together. That's right. Yeah. You that's... can make the, and this is a whole separate bucket. Yeah. And I start, I back to carving your own bucking path. Like <laughs> at one point during sustained best, I've had sustained best for about 10 years now. I said to myself, I'm going to start a hedge fund. And it wasn't like, oh, I want to start a hedge fund. I won't get into it, but a hedge fund is basically just like a fund. You can put anything in it. You can put houses in it. You invest in things. You can invest in chihuahuas or something. Ooh, if you think the value of chihuahuas. Yes. Yeah, so you could actually say, hey, chihuahuas. and then you say to your clients, hey, there's, you just have to invest the money. I'll invest it into the chihuahuas. And if they go up in value in five years, because chihuahuas are great, mm -hmm. then you'll get more money back. So you can put anything in hedge fund, but my, and I'll be quick on this, but it was a pretty awesome um, I had this great idea and I would go to these like cocktail parties in San Francisco with all these fellow greenies. Ooh, like, greenies. Oh, greenies. Yeah. That, that, that's oh, yeah. what you guys are called. Oh yeah. Big partiers, like mm -hmm. just hot smoking, beer drinking, but we care about the planet. But, yeah. and I had this idea for a long short fund and this may sound boring. I'll put it in the book and it's, I thought it was interesting. Everybody was like, we're like smoking weed at parties. Like, dude, you got to run with this idea. So what I wanted to do is I was already long being long a stock. is just buying it. Like, Oh, I think Tesla's going to be great. Long just means you're buying the stock, but you can be short on a stock, which means I think the value of it's going to go down and you can make money on it. So my idea that I pitched to a few clients who eventually I paid an attorney a, a buttload of money to open up this hedge fund. And there's a lot of compliance and stuff behind it, but I was like, why not? Instead of just not owning Exxon, why don't we just short it? Because we think it's going to go down about, or coal mining and you could short anything, you know, you short mm -hmm. Walmart or whatever coal mine. So that was fun because I had a few clients go into the hedge fund. It did really well because I was shorting coal mining. You could buy like Peabody there. Most of them are out of business now, but if you buy shorts on them and the clients are like, this is really cool. So the, they're about to go bankrupt, but this, the, the option I have on that is going up in value. It, it was cool because you were taking your values to the next level. Did it make it a huge change? Probably not, but I eventually started pitching CalPERS and big pensions and foundations and um, it, I closed it. The clients did well. They got their money back. They made money, which in a lot of hedge funds, they don't because mm. you're being so risky. But I was tired of like kissing ass, a lot of ass kissing when you have to raise money for a hedge fund. So I just like, it, it was taking too much of my attention. And I had to shake so many hands. I was just, you don't seem like an ass kiss. Kisser. I'm not. Yeah. And maybe that's a good lesson for any listeners out there. Like kissing ass really sucks. I know you have to do it a little bit, but because um, I felt like the idea was so strong that it didn't need to be, I didn't need to kiss ass to, you know, mm -hmm. so, but maybe I was ahead of my time because I'm starting to see long, short funds mm -hmm. that are sustainably focused. Up, up, but I think, I think you are definitely ahead of the times mm -hmm. it, because again, this is not that long ago, but it is in this awareness and people wanting to put their money sure. in a, to good. Uh, okay. Run us through some quick like, let's say I don't have anything invested anywhere. And I know you have a special product for people that don't have a lot of money, for example, but they can throw it in, you manage it. Yeah. And so let's start there for someone yeah. that doesn't have any money invested, but wants to get in and put their money in a, in a good spot. Yeah. So have I got a deal for you? Oh, no. that's a year. <laughs> no, no, no. Talking <laughs> about sales. Even. <laughs> so it's tough. And I get this all the time and I get emails from young people like, I looked at your website. This is awesome. But I got a hundred bucks and it's tough because, you know, you're not really in that mode where you're loaded and things, but 
So there's, you, there's tons of options. One is just open an account. Like this day and age, you can just go to Schwab or Fidelity and just open an account, right? Don't worry about what's in it. Just get the account open. I run into that a lot. You'd be surprised. Like, oh, I wanted to save money, but I never opened the account. So once the account's open, you're halfway there, regardless of what's in it. But there's tons of sustainable funds that are now offered. It makes it so easy. You open up Schwab, put 500 bucks in it. Um, granted, be careful if it's an IRA or a brokerage account and all that stuff, but that's, that's not rocket science. And then you just buy a sustainably screened fund. How do you find the green fund? You just Google it. Oh. I hate to say that. Like, just Google it. Unless yeah, you hire an advisor, it. Google. And there's mutual funds and ETFs. So be careful. A lot of people are heading into ETFs these days. But um, And there's just so many choices. If you asked me 15 years ago, I would have been like, there's not much out there. You might have 10 funds to pick from. But this day and age, there's like thousands. So that's the first thing. But you can see what happens is, so if somebody has five grand or 10 grand, you know, it's more than a hundred bucks or 200 bucks. There's these thing called, things called robo-advisors now. Everything's becoming robotic, mm, right? Got it. We're yeah. all going to have like yep. robotic other people in our house, right? That's a big thing. Childcare. Not, yeah. Like, and, and even like if, if you're a married person, you know, marriage is great, but it gets, you know, you want to spice it up sometimes, but I've Ooh, bring in the definitely robot. been, yes. Have you heard about this? And, no. the, and this is going off side. You track. blow up. I think they're a little bit more real, they're I'm, a little bit more lifelike. I've not heard about And that. I only bring that up because robots are, they're coming it's in, in yeah. a lot of different they're facets here. of our life. And they're so here. if you just Google robo advisor, <laughs> don't Google robotic mistress or something, but if you Google robotic uh, robo advisor, <laughs> there's a few that are now sustainably screened. Sustain folio mm -hmm. is the one that I have. I'm not pitching it here. Sustain folio, everybody, <laughs> sustain folio. So you, that one is, is 5,000 minimum. Mm -hmm. You know, young people are like, I want to open an IRA. I got five grand, but I, I don't want to talk to anybody. Dale, you're a great guy. You sound like you're funny, but I don't want to talk to you. I just want to go online and do it. And, and that's it. And it automatically buys the sustainably screened funds for you. So that way, you know, you're not going to own coal mining and oil drilling companies. But um, also, it's just a nice step in. A like, cool, mm -hmm. got the account. It's at Schwab. So it's not owned by some random broker that you don't know where the money is. It's easy, but then it gets more complex. And most of my clients, it gets, you know, the ones that are like inheriting from their parents who are passing away and, or they, you know, in the Bay Area, they're selling real estate. And so it, it can get a little bit more complex for people who you know, maybe a robo advisor isn't mm -hmm. in their best interest. But. So there is big money to be made. Who, who in, in the sustainable world, mm -hmm. some people, you know, some say, oh yeah, there's no money in that. Yeah. But there is. Yeah. That's, that's like yeah. so old school. That's mm -hmm. like your uncle <laughs> I'm watching Seinfeld now. That's like uncle, uh, uncle Louie, uncle Leo. Anyhow, if mm -hmm. you're, for the Seinfeld fans out there. Oh yeah. Big he's fan. like the annoying uncle that always <laughs> sees Jerry and like grabs him by his neck and Jerry's like, oh, uncle Leo. but that's old, old thinking, you know, 20 years ago. Um, you know, Uncle Leo is the kind of person who still holds on to like General Electric and Exxon and Chevron stock because that's what they believe in. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, yeah. What would uh, be uh, yeah. the performance? So, sorry. So yeah, the performance, that's like old. Mystery. Yeah. In fact, now what's happening is, and I'm not letting anybody know about returns because the SEC may be listening to this conversation, but what's happening is companies that are addressing this thing called ESG, Environmental Social Governance. Hmm. the worst acronym you could ever, but it's, that's the one that everybody's using now. Companies that are saying, Hey, I'm going to use less water or like, you know, Costco, I'm not saying Costco trade, but they pay their employees like double what they, what Walmart gets paid. So that's ESG. So companies that are doing more of that, if you look at their stock performance and I can give you, I can give you every chart you want to see, like look at Chipotle versus McDonald's. It's crazy. And you're like, Oh, that's because one sells burritos and one's old school. In my opinion, in my weird, weird, weird world, a weird world, <laughs> I feel like it's Chipotle <laughs> that's addressing sustainability mm -hmm. issues, and the stock is being yeah. rewarded mm -hmm. because they're 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 buying local, and the comp and the, their their mm -hmm. customers love it and things like that. So that's a old school way of thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your clientele is is people with a couple hundred thousand hundred million yeah. hundred million Definitely. i think my yeah it's yeah so it's bigger bigger numbers three or four hundred grand is my average client is it okay and they're but they're all over so i will not be your clients i have mm, to say keep but work, if you keep working keep saving keep, yeah exactly keep cold calling and <laughs> cold calling my favorite thing to do mm. um so let's say you you've got the okay google you've got your top five stocks let's say 
what would be some other things that people can do? Let's say they don't, they couldn't be a client necessarily, but they want to keep, keep investing. What is their, is it long-term that you recommend? Like put your money in and sort of don't check it. Yeah. If you're young, definitely. Mm -hmm. Like if you're young, you got to save and you got to work for the (laughs) most part. So I, you know, um, yeah, most clients are long-term. It depends. I have retired clients that are retired nurses from Kaiser, you know, and they have a half a million dollars that they save for their whole life. Different situation, like de- more fixed income. Mm-hmm. Got to be careful, especially with this current market. It's kind of wild right now. Um, so everybody has a different risk profile. You know, even yeah. on sustained folio, when somebody enters into an account, they're going to have to answer a few questions to generate, like, where, how are they going to be allocated? How is the robot going to please them? How is the <laughs> robot, like, going to allocate their their account based upon their risk. So everybody's different. I have some clients who love Tesla. 25% of their account is Tesla stock and mm-hmm. like million dollar accounts. And then I have clients who are like, don't even touch that stock because I already, you know, I got burned on it once years ago when it dropped. And so everybody's different and it's fun. It makes my job really interesting um, because it's not like, it's not like I run one fund. That was like the hedge fund. Mm-hmm. Everybody was in the same thing. This is like, everybody's story is different. Yeah. So cool. I have like people who sail like around, around the Pacific and I never talk to them and they check in every once in a while. And, you know, I have like realtor clients who like travel the world and they have a SEP IRA. I know we've talked about that. And every year I see like 50 grand go into her account. It's because she's selling houses, traveling the world. And then her CPA is telling her like plop that money in that SEP because Mm -hmm. if you want to retire in 10 years, you got to do all that. Right. So it's really neat because everybody's different and everybody has different values. Some people want to own fossil fuels. And I'm like, yeah, not with you. So. No, no. Yeah. You're not going to manage that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That is really uh, cool about that, about this intimacy with your clients, right. because you're dealing with, I mean, money is so personal, yeah. especially as Americans were like really weird about money. You know, there's a chapter in the book that's about like being, sorry. I, you no, know, no. Yeah. It's my Jersey. We yeah. interrupt people in New Jersey. You just interrupt people. That's why I've been in California for 20 years, but it hasn't. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I oh, now you forget what you're yeah, going to say. A great point. Oh, but great. anyhow, um, it was about the eh, working with people when like the stories. Yeah, they have. Oh my god. Oh, money, money. Just the the sensitivity about it. Sure. I find, I guess. Okay, so I've lived in Europe now five years, and I feel like people openly are like, "Well, I make this much a month," and they get paid monthly there instead of every two weeks, like us. So it's crazy just how there's this. Okay, we Openness. make a lot of money, sure. and especially we're here in the Bay Area, like obscene amounts, you know. So I feel like there's this um like secretive nature. Like you would never ask someone how much you earn. Of course, oh. then you see the, the homes, the cars, the lifestyle. But in Europe, it's much more open. It's like this is what I earn. It and it's not flaunted necessarily, but everyone, not everyone, this is general, but it's more of a you live well, but you don't. It's not this excessiveness. Yeah, I, I totally. Guess. People are very like it's very confidential, like yeah. this person, and everybody's different with that. But mm-hmm. the thought that I entered my mind back, bartender, I wrote down bartender because I sometimes feel like that's what I am. Like mm-hmm. I'm literally like a bartender, even though I don't serve drinks to clients. Unless in my office, I do have booze. But you got some booze over there. <laughs> yeah, but they're yeah. not coming in every day to yeah. drink booze. But and it's. I actually thought about opening up a bar to give financial advice at like higher advisors. And this is a love car of your own fucking pet. I don't think the SEC yeah. would be happy the, the higher mm-hmm. being that watches over all of us, but with people coming in drunk, looking for investment advice, but it's fun because how many times have all of us been into a bar and like, you'd have a rough day, you broke up with girlfriend or boyfriend and you literally just let the bartender know what just happened for the last two years of your life. But yeah, you're like a therapist. Y- yeah. And it's fun. But then the money part is very serious because it's what they save for something. So right. you have to balance the bartender. And mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. So you're a good listener. I try. <laughs> it's not easy. You don't interrupt people when they're telling you their life story. <laughs> you do. No, you have to. <laughs> well, it's, it is a very yeah complex role that you've created because again you're not working for anyone else you don't have people like hit your numbers it's you know that's the thing with being a solopreneur is is it is all on you at the same time you're able to do whatever the fuck you want yeah you know it's tough and you're still here yeah 10 years later when i was like what is still what yeah you're it's, still here it's it's taking years off the years off the back end of my life 
you know, because mm-hmm. of the stress that I'm under. Oh. And I'm giving you like this, the dark part of this business is like people literally relinquish. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Like they want to travel for six months in Costa Rica or whatever it is. Yeah. They're relinquishing the anxiety to me, mm-hmm. you know? So right. it's planetary. It's like energy, right? Like that energy that they're now able to use themselves. Cause you're handling their shit. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So okay. Uh, come back to me in 10 years and see if I still look the same. It might not look so pretty. I'm kidding. Well, what, who handles your shit? (laughs) Mm, I do my own. Mm. I handle my own shit. (laughs) It's it's a lot of of handling. Okay. So what are you most proud of? Wow. I know. Sorry. I just got to come in there with that question. Yeah. That's a tough one. I mean, the hard work, definitely like it's now you're starting to see the fruits of your labor, you know, after Mm -hmm. all those years. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you, I have no clue if this is the right path that I'm on, like to save the planet, but it definitely feels better going home at night. There's a lot. Um, I do other things. Like I'm proud of, I don't have this motorcycle anymore. This is nothing. I, I think I was so, you know, stressed out with money and I always am. Oh, that I took an old motorcycle, of an old Honda, 1978 CD 750. And I took the engine out. I had a buddy pulled it. I took the whole thing apart. It took months, maybe six to eight months. I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but sometimes for people listening, like we all, a lot of us use our minds these days and we're on the computer and, mm-hmm. and social media and all that stuff. And sometimes it's nice to get your hands on something. Yeah. Like it's really, I think it's important if people like that kind of thing to do that. And so I don't know. Yeah. Really went long winded on that, but it's, and I sold the motorcycle for less than what I paid for it. Regardless, it was really nice to be able to like, Oh, I took an engine apart. So I'm proud of that. And just starting a business from zero, like you say, carve your own fucking path. Like, man, that's, I'm sure a lot of people have done it. And for those who have, like, you got to be proud of yourself to start, walk away from at least a six figure paycheck to walk away from something like that and a very nice, awesome job because of the fact that you feel like there's something else. Yeah. Um, That's huge. And, and also giving people an insight into when you take that leap, you don't know what's on the other side, but if you never take that leap, then you're just going to stay stuck in that situation. Yeah. And, and it shows your values that you're actually walking the walk, talking the sure. talk instead of, you know, you, yeah, it was a cush, the high salary and everything else. And, yeah. and that's why most people get into finance, I think, because they're like, yeah, sweet paycheck. Sure. And, know, and I always yeah. have to like, like the book is the new thing for me, like the robo advisor. It's just, I feel like, and I think with a lot of people who are entrepreneurial, like you gotta, I feel like I have to do something else. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, sustain best is doing well, but just to do continually do other things, write a book. If you can, yep. like, Reach I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, what's going to happen in five years. It, who knows? But, um, I yeah. just, I can see myself now my mind, like the book keeps my concentration for a little bit. Granted my business does too, but, um, I think for a lot of people out there, it's just important to, you got to change with the times, but at the same time, like make sure you do something that's like challenging your brain a little bit. That's Definitely. Right. Yeah. You, you brought that up a couple of times. And I think that's the, that's not everyone, of course, you know, it takes a, a special personality to, to do that, to want to be, to do more and to really challenge yourself. And writing a book is a huge undertaking. So I commend you for that. Mm-hmm. And I want to acknowledge that you have committed to this and you're still going and you have a lot of knowledge and now you're sharing it. So you're going to be doing more videos, writing this book and telling stories because we all love stories, you know, and that's sort of, I think what connects us and you, you definitely are creating multiple platforms now to share those stories and also the sustained folio. So for people that want to get in at a lower amounts, you're not just, you know, up here that people can start investing. At, with a hundred bucks, you know, and, and really appealing to all types of people. Mm, so Thank nice. you, Dale. You're, you're amazing. Oh, uh, come on now. And <laughs> <laughs> you're making me blush. Oh, he is blushing a little bit. <laughs> and is there anything else you want to share? You know, I, first of all, thank you for having me. Like, this is awesome. Like I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and it's, thank you. It's, even for somebody who's been self-employed for 10 years, um, it's inspirational to hear these other stories for sure. Like you got to hear other people's stories, even though you might be do something completely different and not in the finance world. Um, that's it. Just everybody keep carving your own path if you can. And, but also pay the bills and stuff like that. 
at the same time. And invest. And invest. Get that's right. to investing. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. At the heart of the matter here. Yeah. Get 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 that. Get your shit out of Exxon and all these mm-hmm. evil companies. It's so easy to do it. And if I hear from any of you and you say, oh, I have this Vanguard account, I'm literally just going to hang with the phone. Wait, I have a Vanguard account. There you go. Oh, so no. Get yeah. that shit out of it. Shit. Because they're really not advocates for mm. sustainable investing. So That's so good go. to know. We See, we don't, don't know this stuff. Get we just your shit together. Get your shit together. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dale. Thanks Pleasure. for having me. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. It makes a big difference for visibility. And even better, share this episode with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode every other Wednesday. If you're interested in working together to elevate your online presence, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me on Instagram at whereiswillow. I also hang out on LinkedIn, Willow McDonough. Until then, cheers to carving your own fucking path. I love you.